like everybody's back in here, took a nice little break. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next uh, speaker here in a minute, but first I'd like to talk about some of our sponsors. Um, Nodecraft is the company that brings the entire planet closer through gaming. Its humble beginnings involved lowering the barrier to entry for individuals creating their own Minecraft server. Today, Nodecraft extends that simplicity to enable the creation of servers for any game on any platform. Thanks for being a local sponsor. Another one of our sponsors is Clever. At Clever, they believe technology should just work. It should do what you want, when you want. Their team is made up of wizards who can craft custom software solutions like mobile apps, web apps, virtual reality, augmented reality, cloud computing, and artificial intelligence, which is shaping the future now. Their innovative, quirky, curious, and care about what they do and who they're doing it for. Thanks for being a local sponsor. Okay, so next up is Adam. Um, Adam is a, oh, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Uh, so this is track AB, um, and right next door is CD. I know I've said this about a thousand times today, so sorry if you've heard it too many, but um, if you, um, are in the wrong room, you can switch over. It's a little confusing because we start at A and end at D, um, or start at D and end at A, backwards. <laughs> um, but anyways, okay, so um, our next speaker, Adam Rackus, he is, is gonna talk about the bleeding edge of web development. A, um, me, Adam, a senior web engineer at Spotify, specializing in web infrastructure for Spotify for artists. With a diverse background in various industries, he's here to talk about the exciting world of edge-based web development. Adam will explore the love and occasional challenges of serverless technology. Diving into Vercel Edge workers, their constraints and exceptional benefits, attendees will leave with a deep understanding of the edge workers and how to make them work for web development. Join Adam for an engaging session on the future of web infrastructure. Let's welcome Adam. Thank you for coming out. Welcome to Oklahoma City. Welcome to Thunder Plains. Uh, this talk is the bleeding edge of web development. Uh, I am Adam, I'm a senior web engineer at Spotify, as you just heard. And this is gonna be a talk about web development infrastructure, but made fun. Uh, we're gonna talk about lots of serverless things and lots of the things that make serverless fun. We're not gonna talk about how to do web development. I'm not gonna show you how to do React or Angular or whatever. We're gonna just pretend that you've already built that really cool web application, and now I'm gonna show you some cool ways to get it out in front of actual users. We're gonna start with a very quick, very non-comprehensive, and very painless history of web development. In the beginning, we had our user sitting in front of a browser. They sent a request off. It hit a web server somewhere. Web server might hit a relational database send back some data, web server sends back some HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Life was simple, but not always easy. That poor web server sitting in the middle, responsible for all those requests, it got easily tired, easy, easily overloaded, problems happened. Scaling is hard. So this is the part of the history of web development where we're gonna skip a whole lot of stuff because that's not what this talk is. We're not gonna talk about caching, or scaling out to multiple servers, which is called horizontal scaling, load balancers, you could do an entire conference talk about any one of those individual points. I do wanna just pause briefly and mention horizontal scaling. I don't know if any of you have done system design interviews before, um, but horizontal scaling is worth knowing a little bit about. That, from the simplest uh, point of view, it means going from a single server to more than one server. It can take a lot of forms, but at the end of the day, instead of having one fragile web server handling all our requests, we have more than one. It doesn't have to just be two, more than one. And this is actually really, really hard to do. The picture makes it look simple, but when you are just putting everything through one web server, a lot of things become a lot simpler. And when you start to branch it out across multiple boxes, a lot of things become harder. But let's get back to our story. Scaling is hard. So what do we do about it? This is the part of our talk where a hero emerges, Amazon Web Services in particular. And for a lot of you, maybe AWS is a villain and not a hero. Um, 
But in particular, let's talk about AWS Lambda. Lambda are independent functions that run on demand. AWS handles all the infra for you. They spin up whatever boxes you need, whatever containers that you need to run your function. You just send AWS the code and AWS does the rest. You call that function whenever you want and AWS will spin up as many boxes and as many containers as they need to satisfy all the requests that you're sending over. Originally, this was pitched as compute on demand, which it is, and you would see use cases talked about like, hey, what if my web application allows users to upload a new profile pic? Well, instead of putting that on your one web server that might get overloaded, you can just send the request off to a Lambda function to do monotonous, simple things like crop an image and resize it, stuff like that. It didn't take people long to realize that if you can just run an arbitrary function in a Lambda, you can do anything. You can use a Lambda as a web server. So what does that look like conceptually? Instead of having this single web server being a bottleneck for all our requests that's vulnerable to get overloaded, we can split things up. This is another form of that horizontal scaling that I was showing you a minute ago. Except instead of having more than one web server that you set up and have to create load balancers for, you just put the web code in a lambda and your users will get redirected to any number of those. But that's, if you think about it, it's not that simple because a lambda, first of all, you can't connect to a lambda via a browser. You have to connect other services like CloudFront. You need to set up an HTTP endpoint to your Lambda, and you're gonna just need to get a lot of low-level things working perfectly. So you would think this is gonna be really, really hard. Yeah, I'll get that horizontal scaling, but boy, it's so much easier to just push something to Heroku and just deal with their single box, whatever they've spun up for me. And our side projects don't have users anyway, so it's not like we have to worry about that horizontal scaling. Mine don't either. I'm not throwing any shade on anybody. It turns out this is even easier though because those web providers like Render or Heroku or Fly, some of them ship this instead of setting up like a shared server or a shared little container inside of a server like Heroku does, companies like Vercel will host your web application on AWS for you. So just like Heroku, you go on to Vercel, set up an account if you don't have one already, link it to your GitHub, pick the repo, click a button, and now your web app is up. Except instead of running on a container inside of a web server like it might with Heroku, this is what Vercel gives you out of the box. And life is good. There's a few things you have to do. You have to make sure that your web application is serverless ready. If you are storing session state in memory, that's not gonna work because you no longer have a single web server whose memory you can store the session state in. So you'll need to have persisted sessions. You'll need to have serverless friendly auth. If you're using clerk.dev, you're already all set there. Those are good things to do no matter what. Even if you are running on a single box, do those things. You'll be set up later if you ever wanna make a move. So what's the catch? We're about 10 minutes into a conference talk and it seems like we've solved web development. We're gonna just ship all our web apps to AWS Lambda and we're done. Well, cold starts. So, I told you that AWS will spin up containers and servers as needed to satisfy all these Lambda, all these requests going into your Lambda. Unfortunately, that's not free. It's not terribly expensive, but it's also not free. And you can actually see this and feel it. If you put uh, a web application up on Vercel, if you come back, if you have no users like I don't, and you come back the next morning and you hit your web app, it's gonna be a little sluggish that first time and that's because that lambda is spinning up and we're talking a few hundreds of milliseconds, we're not talking seconds. It's gonna feel sluggish. It's not the end of the world, but it's not great either. And if you ever do get users, that will help because as more users are hitting your application, those lambdas will spin up, satisfy the request, and then they sort of stay warm for a little while. They, they don't die immediately. They'll stick around for a little while to make sure, to, in order to satisfy any other requests that come in in the next few minutes, and then if nothing comes, they will die off. Okay, so we were in a really, really, really good spot here. 
Serverless functions like Lambda give us free horizontal, well, it's not free, AWS will charge you, but free in terms of your time, hopefully your boss is paying the bill. Um, AWS will give you that horizontal scaling out of the box, but we had those pesky cold starts. If only there was a way where we could have the best of both worlds. So this is where our next hero emerges, and this is also where the pun from my talk comes, the bleeding edge of web development. That's where this comes from. We're gonna talk about Cloudflare workers, which are also known colloquially as edge workers. This is kind of a hard slide, but I wanna push through it. If most of this goes over your head, don't worry about it. This doesn't matter. Just know, well, naming is hard, of course. The term edge, it actually means more than one thing. Originally, when we say edge, that would mean like geographical distribution. If you think of a CDN, and you request something from a CDN, the CDN will have an edge network of nodes all around the world, hopefully all around the world if it's a good CDN, and no matter where your user is sitting, they will automatically get routed to the nearest one, which is good. If you have a user sitting in Singapore, you don't want them coming all the way over to Virginia just to get some PNG. You want them to hit the edge node in Singapore. Cool. Um, somewhere along the line, though, Cloudflare workers became known as edge workers. And Cloudflare workers are geographically distributed, but they also can be pinned to a certain part of the world. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that at the very end. But you wind up with this sort of oxymoron where you have Cloudflare workers that only exist in one part of the world called edge workers, which, but who cares? It doesn't matter. Uh, this, this is Dax, and he's really pissed off about this. He's a great dude. You should follow him. He is the creator of this thing called SST, which is a really, really cool product. Throw them a follow on Twitter if you're there. Let's get back to our talk. We're just gonna call Cloudflare workers edge workers and we're not gonna care about any of that naming ambiguity. So what are edge workers? What are Cloudflare workers? They are low latency cloud, function, cloud functions, just like Lambda, but low latency. So no cold start, which is amazing. And they're also geographically distributed. Usually when you ship a Lambda, you tell AWS which region to put it in. They also have Lambda at the edge, which is a separate thing, but for our purposes, edge workers can live anywhere or you can tell them to only be in a certain geographical region, which we're gonna talk about later. And they're fast. They're very, very fast. They do not run on node like AWS Lambda does. They run on V8 isolates, which is why they're so fast, so low latency. So. Seems like we're back to square one. We've got this new kind of cloud function, which is even better than Lambda. We wanna ship our application on it, since it has no cold starts. But now how do we set all that up? It's gotta be a lot of work, right? Well, you're not gonna believe this. The same Vercel that we just saw, you can add a line of code to your app, and you can switch right over to edge functions which is amazing. It's very easy to configure. This is what it looks like in Next. You just export a config object, tell it to stick it on the edge, and it will stick it on the edge, and life is good. All right, so what's the catch? Have we solved web development again? Just put everything on edge and never think about it again, if only. So I told you these run on V8 isolates. They don't run on Node, which is great, because it's fast and low latency. The bad news is they don't run on Node, which means a lot of the stuff that you might take for granted that exists on Node do not exist here. This is getting better. Some of the things are being added to cloud, to, to edge workers. Buffer was just added recently. Um, but make no mistake, there's lots and lots of other things that are not gonna work. In particular, database connections. Which is kind of important, right? You're not gonna build much on the web without talking to some sort of data source. Any database connection drivers that you have are almost certainly not gonna work on edge workers. They are almost certainly gonna be depending on a lot of low-level node libraries, crypto, um, TCP drivers, TCP, low-level TCP plumbing. It's not gonna work. But before you go ditching edge workers and running back to AWS, you might think, well, I'll just eat the cold start, it's not the end of the world, and now I can connect to a database, because that's kind of important. This problem is actually a little bit deeper than that. 
Connecting, creating persistent database connections from any kind of cloud function is bad anyway. It's slow. Setting up that TCP connection to a database is slow. I see a lot of heads nodding. You guys know this. And so if you add that cost on to a cold start, you're making that cold start even worse. But it's even worse than that. These edge functions are great for scaling, but they're bad for connecting to databases directly. Not only are they slow, but any database that you're going to be using is going to have a very hard limit on the number of uh, concurrent connections that you can connect to it. And I actually have a story about this. Uh, if you see me in the hallway or at the after party, I'd be happy to tell you, but my very first dev job, I discovered this firsthand. Let's talk a little bit more about that in detail. So this is what we had before. Let's just remove the users and zoom out a little bit. Each one of those lambdas that's getting spun up eagerly as needed during traffic spikes or whatever, they're all connecting directly to that database. And boy, you're going to exhaust your connection limit on whatever database you're using. It could be SQL Server, Oracle, whatever. There's going to be a connection limit in addition to that perf cost of setting up that TCP connection up front. All right, don't despair. This is a talk about how great serverless is. So we're in a little trough right now, and now we're going to come up, and we are going to talk about amazing things. Serverless is amazing. We can use serverless, and we can still have nice things, and that's what the rest of this talk is. All the cool things that let us have the benefits of edge workers and still ship really, really cool things to the web. Let's start with databases. Let's cut that Gordian knot. Modern day databases have HTTP drivers. So instead of having to create a persistent TCP connection to your box, you can just fetch to some endpoint, add on some sort of bearer token for authorization, and you can query your data or update it or insert or delete or do whatever you want. And V8 isolates, they ship, it's, it's V8 isolates, it's what Chrome is built on. It has a fetch built right in. And there's lots and lots of options here. Depending on what kind of database you like, if you like Postgres, I have never touched Postgres in my life, but I'm told that there's this thing called Postgres, which works and is really cool. And I was just told last night that there's an even better thing called Neon, which is fantastic Postgres HTTP hosting. Thank you for that tip. Um, maybe you're more of a NoSQL kind of person. If so, there's uh, the Atlas platform for Mongo hosting. They have a data API, which is what I said. You fetch right to an API, add the bearer token, and you can query all your Mongo collections. The full aggregation pipeline is available to you, whatever you want to do. I saved the best for last. Uh, PlanetScale is not paying me to say this, but damn it, they should be. PlanetScale is amazing. I love them. They are MySQL hosting. Um, they are absolutely edge ready. They have an insane free tier, five gigs of storage, a billion with a B uh, row reads per month, 10 million row writes. Uh, they have branching, so you can do schema changes just like you do Git branching, which is very safe, very cool. It is one of my favorite things. More nice things that you can have on Edge. You don't have to just create raw SQL queries in your web app. There is this amazing ORM called Drizzle, which I love. Think of Drizzle as a thin static typing layer over SQL. If you've over, always liked SQL, but you didn't like having to sort of guess and run the query to see if you made any typos, Drizzle basically takes SQL and it adds TypeScript to it. So you tell Drizzle what your schema looks like, and Drizzle tells you what valid queries are and yells at you if you try to type something that's not valid. Very, very much edge ready. It will work with anything you can think of. It will connect to any kind of database that you can dream up. There's no Mongo there, obviously, because there's no schema in Mongo, so that wouldn't make sense. But anything else. Maybe you don't like SQL. Maybe you're like, you know what? Me and SQL don't get along. I need a friendly layer between me and the SQL. Well, you've probably heard of Prisma, and they are actually in the process of working on setting up edge compatibility. All right. I have one piece of advice before you go hacking. And there's no more scumbag Steve memes. We're good. We're in a great place. Um, so 
You've decided to use HTTP database drivers with edge functions. Now what? I mentioned earlier that you can pin your edge workers to one geographical part of the world. You absolutely should do this. It doesn't make sense at first. You would think that, hey, if I can set an edge function in Singapore to satisfy the requests from my Singaporean users, that's good, right? Well, your database is probably going to be living in one place. Things like PlanetScale have inter-region replication, but let's just say you've got your PlanetScale MySQL box that PlanetScale is hosting for you, and it's in Virginia, US East 1. You want to pin your edge function to the same place. You want to pin your edge function to US East 1, and let's take a look at that, and let's take a look at why. So you've got your user sitting in Singapore, and if you don't do what I just said, and if they do hit an edge function in Singapore, now they need to request data all the way over to US East 1. And you might think, well, so what? They have to get there anyway. Might as well just hit the edge function that's closer. This is a more realistic look of what most web apps are going to look like. You're not going to have one request for data. You're going to have multiple. And occasionally, later data requests are going to depend on prior data requests. We call that a waterfall. Sometimes it's unavoidable. And sometimes it is avoidable, but we just screw up and we wind up with later data requests that are blocked on previous ones. And you don't want multiple round trips going from Singapore to Virginia just to show some HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. So this is what we want instead. We want to tell our, our edge function, hey, I want you to sit always in US East 1, where my data are, and the Singapore user will just cross the ocean, hit my edge function, and then all those data requests are going to be lightning fast because they're in the same region, they're going to be lower latency, and things are going to be a lot faster. How do we do that? Again, Vercel makes it easy, like it makes everything easy. Vercel's not paying me either. Again, they should be. Um, I'm just a fan, though. I, I love them. Uh, I showed you some next code. It's the same idea with SvelteKit. You tell it runtime edge, and if you want, you can also tell it the regions to limit itself. And for some reason, Vercel likes to call US East 1 IAD 1. I have no idea how that happened, but it is what it is. All right, so we solved the database problem. What about the next problem? There's not always going to be a silver bullet. Sometimes you are going to need to use things that just don't work on edge functions. Here's a couple examples. Firebase, let's say you're, you take your web app and you're like, hey, I want to also build a web, or excuse me, a mobile version, and I want to handle my authentication through Firebase. Firebase drivers, last I checked, they will not run on edge functions. Um, remember we talked about uploading profile pics and then cropping them and sizing them? Uh, maybe you're using a library called Sharp for that. It's a great library. Last I checked, it does not run on edge. They use a lot of low-level node things. All is not lost, um, at least for Next and SvelteKit, the Vercel frameworks. You can configure Edge versus AWS at a route layer. So if you need to do some stuff with Next, you need to do some stuff with Firebase, just create an API route, put that stuff in there, and then tell Next or Vercel that that route is not going to be Edge. That route's going to be AWS. And yes, when your user uploads a profile pic, they might get a 300 millisecond cold start. They'll live. They're already signed up on your app. They're already there. They're uploading a profile pic. They're committed. They're not just hitting an e-commerce site on a whim and going to buy it or not buy it if you render in 100 milliseconds. It'll be fine. How about other uses for edge functions? If you've used next.js, you might be familiar with their middleware feature. Middleware are functions that run before every single request, and they let you do things like rewrite headers, redirect. You can even do really cool things like A-B tests. You can stick users in different A-B buckets and ship them different features, and hopefully you have some sort of observability to see whether they like the one or the other better statistically. And to help you do things like that, Vercel has a whole lot of uh, ancillary features. They have their own version of S3 that lives on the edge. They have their own uh, Redis on the edge. I'm told these things are very expensive. So make sure your boss is paying for them before you go firing up those services. And they have more services like this. Uh, I'm not going to spend time selling you on Vercel services. Um, suffice it to say, edge functions have a ton of uses, low latency, 
which enables all sorts of uh, features. Oh, and these sorts of things do depend on these edge workers being actual edge workers, because these are going to run on Vercel's edge network wherever your users are. So if you have a user in Singapore, they are going to hit middleware on an edge node in Singapore, because you want that A, B test determination to be made immediately before they leave Singapore and go requesting data. So that's, that is where an edge function actually is an edge function and not just a Cloudflare worker. All right, wrapping up, uh, I'd like to thank the wonderful people who made this conference happen. Uh, thank you all for listening. And if anybody has questions, I'd love to field them, and I'll do my best uh, to answer them. Yes, sir. The middleware, do they do, do caching? Uh, yeah. You have to set it up, though. Sign up for some Redis on the edge, and you can do caching. What do you recommend at any time to use Kubernetes over Lambda? What do I recommend? Uh, when would I recommend Kubernetes over Lambda? That's a little over my head. Um, I've made it this far in my career without having to mess with Kubernetes. So we'll, <laughs> fingers crossed. I have not played with job queues on the edge, no. I'm sure they're awesome. Are they awesome? Uh, Cloudflare are not bad. Cloudflare are not bad. Cool. It's good to know. Is that like a AWS, uh, whatever they call their stack, their event queue? They have a version of that on Cloudflare? Less features. Less features? Cool. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right. Well, we stopped a little early right before lunch. I'm sorry to do that to you. I think you'll recover. If anybody has any other questions, uh, just hit me up anytime. I'm happy to talk. All right, thank you all for listening.